There's no question, when you change the wheel size on the front of your motorcycle, it will change how the bike handles. Everybody talks about the rake number, but there are a lot of other factors that have to do with the total steering geometry that will affect how the bike handles. So what I'm going to do, we're working on the Chevelle, obviously. I'm actually on day three of doing the alignment because I had clearance issues between the uh, control arm and the massive headers that are on this thing. Uh, but stay tuned for the upcoming feature video I'm doing on the Chevelle. It's probably going to be a half hour, 45 minute video. I'm going to share everything about the car, where it came from, my story behind it, why I own it, and why it means so much to me. So stay tuned for that. I'll probably have that out here in a couple of weeks. Anyway, while doing the alignment on this, it just kind of hit me how uh, that there aren't very many really good explanations out there that I've heard to help you understand how changing a wheel size on the front of a bike and the total steering geometry and how everything affects how the bike handles in total. So I thought the best way to explain this is to explain how the alignment is done on a car and then transfer that to a motorcycle to make it a little easier to understand. So this video is going to be very generic. Let's keep that in mind. I just want everyone to have an idea of, of how all of this stuff works. Some of the numbers, some of the specifications may vary depending on what you've done, but for the most part, it'll give you a good idea. So when you're doing an alignment on a car, especially these old cars, things are, things are quite a bit different than what they are now. Now you have more adjustments that are easy to make. You have eccentrics that are in the control arms uh, and th that you can just turn to change the different settings. Well, uh, aligning these old cars here is almost becoming a, a lost art. And believe it or not, you can do it with some very simple tools. So you can see here, I've got uh, basically this T-bar that clamps to the wheel and I'm using a digital angle finder. It really is that simple. Now you can, and of course I'll run tape measures for one of the specs. I'll get to what each spec is in a second. Uh, you can run strings around the car. There's all types of different ways to do this, but in reality, you do not have to have a very expensive alignment rack to align a car. It can be done with springs and jack, or strings and jack stands and things like that. So let's talk about some of the different aspects of geometry. Now there, there are several, but we're going to talk about the major three. Okay, the first ones. All right, so the one of the measurements is camber. Now, camber is, if we're looking at the wheel here, camber is the inward or outward lean of the tire and wheel. Okay? And typically, what would happen on an older car like this, you would want about a half a degree of negative camber, which means the tire from the relative to the top of the tire, it leans in just a little bit. You'd want about a half a degree of negative camber. Now, if you do autocross stuff and you want a much faster steering to it, then you would actually dial in some positive camber. And when you dial that positive camber in, it makes the steering wheel feel a little twitchy, but it, it also makes it more responsive. Another reason to dial in on these old cars, that half degree of negative camber, actually when you're going down the road, the front end can lift up a little bit, and especially under hard acceleration. And I may find, because this car is close to 700 horsepower, I may find that I actually want a little more negative camber in it, bringing it in a little more, because when I hit the gas, front end comes up on this thing. So depending on when I hit it and do a launch, how twitchy that steering wheel is, uh, if it's a little too twitchy for me, I may end up dialing in a little more negative camber. That way when the front end raises up, the tires will come in and it won't be as twitchy under the launch. So that's camber. Then you have caster. Now if you think of caster, think in terms of a, of a shopping cart, how the front wheels work on that. If you look, you have the, the swivel point on the, the, on the front wheel and the axle is considerably further behind. And that is a tremendous amount of negative caster. It basically forces the wheel to stay straight. Now, how that is on a car, you can also kind of call it kingpin angle. There's a couple of different terms for that. But anyway, you have an upper and a lower ball joint in the control arm, and it's the, the caster is the kingpin angle, if you will, which is a straight line between the upper and lower ball joint. So I can add or remove shims in the upper control arm to change that forward or rearward 
angle. This is very important and I'll get to how this transfers to motorcycles here in just a second. So how I change that kingpin angle, tilting that tire front and back uh, relative to its center line, will determine how it tracks when it goes down the road. So for example, if I have a little bit of positive caster into it, essentially the opposite of what you would see on a shopping cart, at speed and the faster I go, it's going to be incredibly stable. Okay, now and uh, you know the the faster you go, it's that basically that tire is going to want to stay straight with that uh, positive caster adjustment. Now, when you start getting into negative caster, for example, like on manual steering cars, like say on my my old forty nine GMC. All right, so it's all stock suspension underneath that thing, but it's a manual steering truck, all right? If you dial in a little less caster, almost zero caster, it's going to be much easier to steer the front end, okay? So you, you don't have to put in as much effort to turn the wheel. The trade-off to that is it's not as stable at higher speeds, but it's a 49 GMC with its original 270 in line six. It makes a whopping 80 horsepower. And it's geared incredibly low. Well, not incredibly, at a 410 rear end. So we're doing 55, 60 miles an hour. It's not a fast vehicle that I'm gonna be doing launches in. So I dialed the caster in at that actually at zero. And it makes the truck incredibly easy to steer almost as if it had power steering on it. Now on a power steering car, like this car was originally manual steering and I put the power steering on it. So when you put on the power steering, you can actually dial in more positive caster because you have assistance turning the wheel. You can dial in more caster and that will help it track much straighter going down the road. So that's caster. Next you have toe. Toe is literally the in and out of the front wheels. Okay, now on these older suspensions where you have all you know multiple components, it's not like a rack and pinion or anything. There's always amount of, a certain amount of play in that front end between each of the you know the tie rods and the pitman arm and all that type of stuff. So one of the tricks you can do with that, you actually to take up all of that slack, all of the, that looseness of the front end, you can dial in just a little bit more toe, actually toe in both front tires facing each other and as you're going down the road it will actually pull the front wheels back out and make the vehicle the, the tires actually go completely straight all right so to give you an idea of the specifications so on this i would want somewhere between three and a half and five and a half degrees of caster positive caster then i'm going to dial in about a half of a degree of camber, negative camber into it, and then about a sixteenth of an inch total toe. So you've got, you know, if you measured both, then you would have a sixteenth of an inch total toe. All right, now those may change. After I do that, I'll take it for a test drive. And if it feels like it's tracking perfectly straight, then I know I'm pretty darn good with the camber adjustment. All right. Now, one th another interesting thing about caster, all roads have a crown to them. All right. So you can actually dial in about a half a degree extra caster on the driver's side or pull out some on the passenger side, which forces the vehicle to track straight regardless of the crown in the road. So I'll probably have about a half a degree more caster on the driver's side than on the passenger side. All right. Now, how does all of this relate to motorcycles? So everyone talks about the rate number, but nobody talks about the trail number. So let's say, for example, you, you in, in, in installed a, a 21 inch front wheel without changing anything on the front end. You kept the stock tree in it. Well, when you change that, you're changing the angles, very similar to your kingpin angles here. You're changing the angle of the neck then also you have a certain amount of rake that's in the tree, but you're changing the axle's position relative to the line between the axle to the ground and then the neck to the ground. As the wheel gets higher, that number changes. You're essentially, you're changing the, what we're calling trail numbers. You're essentially changing the caster, okay? 
So when you modify that caster, just like the example with the car, you dial in more caster, it's going to be more stable at high speeds. You dial in less caster, it's going to be less stable at high speeds. So even when you compare, say, sport bikes to touring bikes and different models of touring bikes across different manufacturers' lines, depending on how fast they expect their average rider to ride that bike, their trail number will be different. Again, that trail number is very similar to that caster adjustment. All right, so when you go with that larger front wheel, technically you're changing the caster. You're changing what I'm calling caster is essentially the trail number, okay? At how far that axle's trailing behind relative to the wheel. So it's going to change how it rides. So for example, I'm sure you've may, you may have seen or heard of the high-speed wobbles, people putting on you know, a 21 or even a 23 and just focusing on the rake number, not being concerned about that trail number. It will feel very unstable at high speeds, okay? So if it's very unstable at high speeds, their caster or their trail number is a little too short. It needs a little more trail in order for it to be stable at the higher speeds. The other thing you've noticed as you go higher with a you know, larger front wheel, you'll notice your front end feels heavier, typically at slower speeds, but that varies depending on how much trail and rake you have in the front end. So the biggest confusion with this is that everyone seems to start with the rake number. Basically, someone should work for the trail number backwards. Okay, obviously you gotta have a certain amount of rake in the bike in order for the front wheel to clear. But you should almost work backwards from the trail number. Determine exactly how the bike is going to be used. Come up with a good trail number. And then with the front size of the front wheel, you work your way backwards to determine how much rake you need. Either it be through the trees or through the frame or a combination of both to achieve that particular number. Now, there are a couple of interesting things, too, where we had talked about toe, all right? Now, toe can actually be adjusted on a motorcycle, believe it or not, and that's going to be your front wheel alignment relative to the rear wheel. Now, you can't really change front wheel alignment, but remember also the crown in the road. But what we can do is change the rear wheel alignment. You can't always trust the eccentrics on the axles to be perfect. You also can't trust the marks on the swing arm. You can't just count the, the number of threads on a bolt if yours is adjustable in that fashion. Uh, you have, it, the proper way to do it is to actually measure from the swing arm pivot shaft uh, to the center of the axle, and that would get you a perfect alignment. Because we have to remember on a Harley, the rear wheel is connected to the engine. Now on the older bikes, the older frames, you could actually align the engine to the frame. And because if, if I'm sure you've seen them, the struts that, you know, on the engine mount below and the strut that's up top, they all had adjustments on them. So you could actually dial in a certain amount of toe on that rear wheel, align the engine to the frame. And when you align those two perfectly, you have a bike that runs perfectly straight down the road. Now, unfortunately, on the modern bikes, there really is no adjustment for that. They're fixed in position. So there's no way to align the engine to the frame, but what we can do is change the alignment of the rear wheel slightly. So if you have a bike that pulls hard to one side, granted if your suspension is healthy and everything is as it should be there and your braking system and all that is healthy, and weight in your saddlebags are equally distributed, that crown in the road pulling you to one side, most of the time it is your alignment of the front and rear wheel. So quite often, you can center that wheel, take it for a ride, see how it feels on the crown of the road. If you find it's pulling too hard one side or the other, you can actually change that alignment of that rear wheel slightly in one direction or another to help keep the bike centered on the road despite, despite the crown in the road. Now, you have one other factor in a motorcycle that you don't have in a car, and that's you, your ability to lean. All right, so when you're riding down the road and you have a crown on the road, you're actually, to hold the bike straight, you're leaning to one side a little bit, which keeps the bike tracking straight. That is camber. You are the camber adjustment, just like leaning this tire in and out. So the more you lean to one side, 
it tracks a straight line. And that's camber. And that's how automotive alignments are really no different than motorcycle alignments. I hope this explains a little bit on rake and trail and why those numbers are important and how it can affect how your motorcycle handles. Thanks again for watching guys. We appreciate it. Thank you very much again to all of our channel members. Remember, keep an eye out for the feature video on this car. I am almost done with it. So uh, we've also got the videos coming up on the M8 versus twin cam. We're doing the teardown on a twin cam, doing the teardown on an M8. Each of those are going to be different videos. We're going to compare uh, inspection of different parts as everything comes apart, which will be pretty cool, I think. And uh, then we're going to dive into the assembly of both of those engines. Those will be the next videos, and we'll compare how those are different. And then we'll work our way into the tuning process. So thanks again for watching, guys. Hope you take care of yourselves and each other. If you haven't, smash the subscribe button below and hit the reminder bell and choose notifications for all future video updates. Take care of yourselves and each other. Have a good one.